In April 2007, as federal agents are raiding Ed Oaken's office, Candace Graham in California is ready to move forward buying an investment property. She has $3.1 million with Janet DeShields' qualified intermediary, and she calls DeShields' office to let her know that she will need her money. She was not in the office, and um, the office staff hemmed and hawed, and finally, after much questioning, I found out she was no longer with the company. Graham learns that DeShield has sold her company to Ed Oaken. When I tried to call Ed Oaken, I got a phone recording that was very, very strange, and it was a music recording that said, I'm too sexy for my shirt, basically, over and over again. And then I really knew I was dealing with <laughs> a complete disaster. In time, she learns that Oaken is under federal investigation, and the money that she thought was safely in escrow is gone. I absolutely panicked. This is everything I had worked for for my entire life. And I didn't know what to do. It just was uh, devastating. At that time, outside Washington, D.C., Bonnie Schluss gets the same news. And I said, wait a minute. How could this possibly happen? I did what the government told me to do. I put it in a, an escrow account that had a bond on it. She is not alone. As many as 250 people think their money is safely on deposit in Oaken's qualified intermediaries when the plug is finally pulled on his game. Many of the victims lost their life savings. I mean, they, they counted on these investment properties as income so that they could retire, so that they could pay bills, so that they could send their kids to college. I mean, these were horribly sad stories. For months, in his bunker on Hibiscus Island, Oaken is still hoping to avoid prosecution. And he keeps up the story. He can get a loan. He will pay everything back. And even today, in a telephone interview with American Greed, he makes this same claim. I was recapitalizing all of my real estate with a $250 million loan to pay off whatever I owed the QIs, shut them down, and be able to go acquire more real estate. But Oaken has no ability to get a loan. Later, the findings of a bankruptcy trustee discover that even the yacht has an $8 million loan against it. Ed Oaken is out of money. And that explains his next step, which was reported to the feds in March of 2008. The team received a phone call from the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. Uh, indicating that Mr. Oaken and Simone had just traveled to Palm Beach County from Miami to pawn approximately a million dollars worth of jewelry, and they received about $200,000 back from that pawn. And we became very concerned that Mr. Oaken had become desperate and was preparing to flee. Immediately, the investigators prepare a 27-count indictment charging Oaken with conspiracy to commit mail and wire fraud and money laundering. He is arrested at his house on Hibiscus Island a few days later and is adamant that he has done nothing wrong. Mr. Oaken now portrays himself as a victim, a victim of uh, a rogue system, a rogue prosecutor, rogue postal inspectors, folks who didn't follow the rules, and he just keeps blaming everyone but himself. Oaken maintains that recent court decisions support his case. I was advised I could do this, and I can, as the law now proves. The qualified intermediary owns the property and owns the funds outright. Because we own them, we are allowed to use and invest the funds in any manner we see fit without any restriction. And he points out he never missed a closing until the feds ruined everything. As long as you can meet your closing demands, there's nothing restricted or regulated about this business. And you can basically invest it in whatever you want. For Oaken, that's a defense. For his victims, it's an outrage. There's no excuse for this. This is an industry that the government created. It's a multi-billion dollar industry and there's no regulations on it, and I've been the victim of it. 
The qualified intermediary is not a qualified intermediary. It's just somebody who is not a disqualified intermediary. Since 2008, settlements from bankruptcy and class action lawsuits against Oaken's banks and insurance companies have brought in almost 70% of the money he took. And now, Oaken's victims are working on behalf of future victims. Bonnie Schluss is constantly trying to meet with members of Congress to ask for stronger regulation. My goal is so it doesn't happen to anybody else. You know, there's no excuse for it. There are simple changes that could be made in the law to make it safer. Back in Richmond, Lara Coleman pleads guilty to conspiring to commit wire and mail fraud. She is sentenced to five years in federal prison. Ed Oaken believes he is innocent and stands trial in March 2009. Bonnie Schluss is there every day. He was never sorry. He never once said he was sorry. Even at the trial, he was given a chance to say anything. He said nothing. He watched all of us. And no emotion, no nothing. Oaken is convicted on all counts. At his sentencing hearing, there is a surprise witness, his first wife. I went to the sentencing because they might think that this was new behavior. And of course, I knew that it really was part of his personality. And this is who he was. And he's, he had been like this a long time. After hearing from Oaken's victims directly, the judge hands down a sentence that will mean life in prison for Ed Oaken. In August, he is sentenced to 100 years. A lot of people I've heard say, well, murderers don't get that. Why, why does that happen? But the problem is, is they don't, they don't understand. You've got hundreds of people that have had their, their dreams stolen by this man. And he doesn't have the decency to apologize or to empathize or to say, I'm sorry that happened to you. So, 100 years was the correct sentence for him. The judge got that one right. Next, on Unsolved Mysteries. He was television's first Superman. But off screen, actor George Reeves was a mere mortal. No match for a balloon.